All right, everybody, welcome to the first webinar of 2016. I'm starting. Nobody's on yet right now. Sorry for the poor video quality. My other computer crashed. But today we're going to go through the concepts of collaborative literacy, as the name suggests, for the collaborative literacy webinar, starting at the overview picture of where OSE is today, things like the roadmap and where we stand right now. Uh, the concept is that to complete a project like the Global Village Construction Set, where we design and build open source industrial machines, a new operating system for civilization to, to recreate manufacturing and recreate a new economy. The designing these machines, posting the plans online for free requires a lot of people. What we've noticed so far is that, of course, the project is very ambitious, takes a long time. And you can look at the roadmap to get a feeling for where we are. And that's, that's the link to the roadmap right here the milestones that we have reached to date and what is yet outstanding for the the next 20 years so why a roadmap well here's the road of where are we going where do you find me you can find me on a road so as we communicate in terms of collaborative literacy as we communicate to other projects where we are what we're doing we can refer people to the roadmap as the overall underlying <clears throat> document that binds us all. So I'll go through that very quickly and then go on to the current project. So back in 2003, the OC concept was formulated and, and we got the permanent land here at Factory Farm in 2006 and we started to build. Uh, first thing we needed was to build some housing. So we built the first brick press prototype in 2007, first tractor prototype in 2008. By that time, I ran out of cash, started True, Fund, True Fans crowdfunding, and thank you to all the True Fans that have supported us throughout the years. We have about uh, 200 or so True Fans currently providing $2, $10 a month to, to continue the crowdfunding. So building all the machines, getting crowd crowdsourced to do that, getting initial collaboration going. Until 2011, we exploded with a TED Talk and then a first independent machine replication. Um, lots of different machines were built. The first one day build we, <clears throat> we have achieved in 2012, building the brick press in a very long single day, but we showed that we can manufacture machines on a very rapid time scale. That's when we also published the distributed enterprise concept, which is what I'll be focusing on right now. The brunt of the current effort revolves around this distributed enterprise, where what we notice in a volunteer project is how do you get the positive cash flows, positive resource feedback loops that make people continue and develop um, and put in the time that's required to do do a very large project it takes a lot of resources it's so one of the things we're finding out is that of course many people come in and go but how do you get a s stable cash flow to bootstrap an operation well that's where the distributed enterprise concept comes about the last point of developing any technology is you, you start with the product designs and then you go to productization what we do is open source both the machine designs and then we open source the actual enterprise that's related to that so that we can create that open source economy of which open source ecology is after so we continue with that uh, with the development process all the way until we reach the distributive enterprise phase which is really the last phase of the development of any any technology of interest and the, the thing about the distributed enterprise concept, and you can read more about it on a wiki, you can type in in a, in a title bar here, distributed enterprise. Um, you can read more about it on the wiki. Um, so there's the, I'm gonna type, since a person joined, I'm gonna just type in the reference document here. So I'm just blowing through all the stuff that we're working on going through the roadmap right now. So if you go to the roadmap, which is the first link, on the Monday, 20, February 20 to 2016, you see this going through the um, 2012 distributed enterprise concept was formulated. And right now we're taking that to fruition with the first 3D printer workshop, which is intended to, to be open source. We can generate revenue from the 3D printing workshop, but also encourage anybody, collaborators or other projects to use that because uh, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel to make ends meet. And the theory is, if we have enough people picking up open source enterprise, we're collaborating on development, in principle, we can get products that are better than proprietary counterparts. Let's continue on the roadmap 
By 2013, we published the Civilization Starter Kit version 0.01. The tractor, brick press, salt pulverizer, and the power unit were in there, called version 0.01 because it was a real, real early release, part of the Christmas gift to the world. Um, but um, by 2013, we had 67 machines built total in five countries. Right now, that figure stands at about 100 and about um, about eight or so countries. And in 2013, we also achieved real-time build documentation. And I will point that out as significant because when you build things, it's hard to document things. So we figured out that by involving remote people in the builds through internet, Google Hangouts and things like that, we can have people on the other side generate documentation as we do the build itself. 2013, we also built the first Microhouse prototype. I'm sitting in Microhouse version 4 right now. This is where I'm at right now. We continued a number of Microhouse builds. And then uh, the workshop revenue model was demonstrated for the first time in 2014 is when we started to run workshops on the machines and products that we develop. So the revenue, talking about the distributed enterprise concept, started to happen, but it's very hard to replicate the workshops that we do. They take a lot of energy, hundreds of hours to prepare everything for a single workshops. Um, but we did demonstrate, for example, that in the machine build of the brick press, we could generate $10,000 over a weekend workshop where we sell the machine and charge people tuition for, for attending the workshop. So there is a revenue model there. 2015, I would say the main milestone, you know, going along, keeping on doing what we do, developing buildings, machines, uh, products of machines are building. So we, so we use the brick press to, for example, to build our aquaponic greenhouse. Well, not the greenhouse itself, but the greenhouse, aquaponic greenhouse was a, perhaps the biggest success of 2015. We generated a lot of interest in that. A lot of people participated and, and are we are working forward towards making a replicable model for doing that. Um, I'm going to ask that whoever's on the webinar here, I'm going to paste in the link for Donald, who just joined it here. But we're going through the links in that I'm, I'm on the roadmap. Uh, so so the aquaponic greenhouse right now, we're looking at how we can feed ourselves from that. And it looks really good on Facebook right now. Um, the things are started in the middle of winter. Right now, we've got abundance of bok choy, lettuce, and, and um, kale. And pushing that forward. So 2016, that brings us to this year. What are the goals for this year? Four major goals for this year, and that is first, the first distributed enterprise as a bootstrap funding proof of concept. This is the 3D printer workshop that you can link on. You'll see that later on. But that's just been announced on Facebook. We already have a registration or two. Um, developing this model as a way where we publish how exactly do you build a 3D printer. So on one, one level, it's extremely efficient in, in terms of the build, as, as in we're going to build that in a single day. To our knowledge, nobody is offering one-day build workshops. It typically takes, uh, the, the, the other one that I know of that's happening right now takes 24 hours, but we're really, really streamlining, preparing, doing the workflow right and documenting how that's done in a workshop setting. But then second, we're documenting the actual enterprise. So how can we get many people to, to generate revenue by, um, let's see, I'm going to mute. Donald, can you mute yourself or can I mute you there? I'll try to mute myself. I don't know why I can't. My, my internet's not working here because I can't mute you. Okay, please do that. Um, so continuing with the milestones, first distributed enterprise of the 3D printer and showing that we can generate collaborative development on a greater scale because people have that direct incentive of revenue being in there. And it's, it's just such a small machine. It's much smaller than our tractors and brick presses, which are uh, quite impressive, but it's much harder to take it to that last, very, very last step of distributed enterprise. So while the, the 3D printer is maybe not super important well it, it can be but it may not be as ambitious as the larger builds it still proves uh, what, why we choose that is because it allows us to take the very very last step which is the enterprise development all the elements around what it means to run an open business where you have many people worldwide contributing to the actual design of the enterprise where people uh, have that positive capital feedback loop because 
we can make money on this. There's there's revenue. It's actually a production model that, in principle, can re, uh, can be a contender, a real contender to centralized production. Can community-based manufacturing, where imagine the process goes to to a such a high quality of standards of of organization and social process and quality control that um, we can, for example. One MC, like say I'm running the event, there's an entire audience of people. Can all those people, you know, like 50 or 100, can all those people succeed because we create an environment where people can teach each other and the documentation is so good that we can manage that while taking care of quality control for this whole crowd? I think that's kind of the, the modern barnstorm <laughs> brains, uh, barn, sorry, barn raising reinvented. But what if a model could be created where we can do these massive community scale builds for just about anything? And the 3D printer is a good way to demonstrate it up front um, with something that's already a product. Okay, so that's the 3D printer distributed enterprise. The other, the second main goal for 2016 is the brick press production enterprise. So just like the 3D printer, where we're developing some of the business finalization of the enterprise models, we want to do the same for the brick press. So that being a fully turnkey product that people can either buy from us, they can fabricate it themselves, the, the instructionals are perfect. Uh, we basically distribute that and get that spread far and wide. That's milestone two. Milestone three for 2016, uh, moving forward on the open source product development platform, version 0.01. .01. So continuing the process of how do many, many people work together on technology development, one main idea that we're exploring on that front could be perhaps the construction sets within FreeCAD. So FreeCAD is an open source uh, 3D CAD package and we want to basically put all of our library parts, for example, in the tractor construction set, all the different parts, and publish a design guide such that you can design using the design principles, but more importantly, the open source libraries of parts within a, within a computer-aided design platform. And that way you have all that engineering is essentially done. It turns li into like Lego parts, which you can, you can build effectively. So that would be moving forward on the open source product development platform. It, it also includes a lot about different workflows and teams design sprints and just trying to put that whole mess together it's it's just a long process there is encouraging news for example in europe the uh, one one project has been funded in europe on an open source product development pipeline which is a university project so there is some you know people are getting more and more aware of this open source product development uh, concept though that's still the proprietary r d is the the king still at this date okay so Fourth main goal for 2016 is the heavy equipment construction set part library. That is that is what I just mentioned. Uh, parts that are put into FreeCAD that people can design with and we can start having many people get involved on the design front and then prototyping, kind of like Local Motors does with, I guess, with cars, but um, we have, but, we're, but where we have specific parts that we use that we've proven already that we know work and people can then make various number of many different implementations of of the tractor if you treat it as a construction set so i'll just briefly go through the further goals kind of like what's coming down the pipe <laughs> from 2017 to 2035 it's a general general process of, of what we see happening but while we we try to master the mechanical technology by 2016 with a tractor construction set the next step is starting to make our own parts so for 2017 the first thing is precision machining construction set part library so once again mastering the ability to do precision heavy machining like cnc machining and other things to make to start making parts if we do the bulk custom fabrication work in the tractor construction set in 2016 you gotta start making your engines and parts after that uh, next <coughs> milestone which we're starting in 2016 is but for 2017 is the replicable building construction enterprise we're starting the open Bu building institute for replicable open source housing that's a big initiative we're gonna we're looking at running a kickstarter probably in in june on this so it's a big thing coming up next thing for 2017 replicable agriculture enterprise uh, we have an entrepreneur in residence here on the agriculture part right now and as we develop the heavy machines we can have reliable um, 
machinery. I mean, it's a lot about uh, agriculture is a lot about materials handling. A lot of the different infrastructure tax tasks are about materials handling. We're developing the heavy machines to be able to do that and applying it in agriculture. So a replicable agriculture enterprise, uh, seeing what that looks like as an open source CSA or whatever that may be. Uh, 2017 viral replication of builds greater than a thousand. Well, let's see if that can happen. That could happen with a 3D printer, with a brick press, with a tractor. If we get the tractor construction set with the CNC torch table in place, then we can have a lot of different builds. Okay, main mi milestone for 2018, power electronics construction set. We haven't really touched that yet. We haven't gotten much into power electronics, things like inverters or, in or induction furnace power supplies or windmill power, power handling systems. That's, that's coming up a little bit. We're fo focusing on a mechanical part right now. And by the time we develop the the induction furnace then by 2019 we're talking about metal rolling construction set metal rolling that means we're getting finally to the point where we're taking raw steel well scrap steel melting it and rolling it into virgin steel that's that will be the main accomplishment for 2019 where essentially anywhere that you have a scrap steel infrastructure you can rebuild up to precision parts you got the steel you can precision machine it and you can literally create advanced civilization if you have that capacity. Okay, so 2020, 2020, continuing open source energy infrastructure. So that would mean we can make things like windmills or, or charging systems for photovoltaics with the power electronics, with the ability to create metal. Those are the kinds of milestones I'm, I'm pretty much outlining are some of the major kind of areas of endeavor. There's housing, there's agriculture, there's construction, there's manufacturing. So basically year by year, we get into the more complicated aspects of the set. So by 2021, we get to the most advanced feature of the Global Village construction set, which is aluminum extraction from clay. That's basically a, a, a materials processing industrial plant on a small scale. Once again, trying to put that all into the 4,000 tiny, uh, 4,000 square foot tiny production facility. Um, let's see what it takes to do that. At that time, we also look into getting into other materials like bio, bioplastics and other biomaterials production. So like bioplastics, such as plastics from plants, uh, make things like glazing for greenhouses. And then by 2022, getting a little even more crazy, if we can build anything in civilization by making our metal, precision machining it and so forth, we can make a factory to make open source photovoltaics happen. So actually manufacturing photovoltaics, which is semiconductors now by 2022 as an open source enterprise. That's that's the next logical progression. We have masters metals, mastered metals, machining. That's the metal age or what is that called? The industrial age, that's metal. And then the next next generation is is the information age, which which means semiconductors. Now, photovoltaics are an example of that, that, that may be within the reach of the set. Um, okay, 2023, one milestone there is cloud editable document infrastructure. Why I put that down is because right now there's a, a near complete monopoly on cloud editable document infrastructure such as Google Docs. Uh, that kind of capacity really needs to be much more open source than it is today. So if nobody beats us to it, we're gonna get to that by 2023. So that marks the time when pretty much all of the GVCS is done, 2023. That's that's gives us a few years, about seven seven years or so. And then we move on to what, what happens with, with uh, human progress after that. So education. So 2024, integrated human education developed. That means an alternative to a normal college education. We, we give, um, we produce what's known as integrated <laughs> You can look Google, look up integrated human, what that means on the OSE wiki. But basically integrated systems thinking education that can get you to, to a modern standard of living. That's part of the um, a more integrated education system for tomorrow. The G, by 2024, we want to complete all the GVCS distributive enterprises. That means take every single product that we have, if we have developed them to the product level, take them to the enterprise level. So we're continuing that in an ongoing fashion, at, such as this year, starting with a, with a 3D printer and the, the brick press as the distributive enterprises for this year. All of them completed by 2024. That means we've got the micro factory, the flexible fabrication open source fab lab, 
that can produce just about anything and a highly productive model that's that can reinvent manufacturing as a viable system in an open source so by 2025 we want to complete the open source product development methodology which is what we're after how do you develop collaboratively and that's why we're trying to get everybody around the concept of collaborative literacy what does it mean to really build upon uh, prior work with others by that time by 2025 we're saying that the one one billion dollar open source economy has been achieved that means with our work and all other kinds of where we rally with all other kinds of open source projects that quantity of open source development just rockets through the roof right now the um, numbers that we're talking about is about 30 to 50 million not our work but but other companies like spark fun maybe lulzbot adafruit other open source hardware companies the the latest figures i've seen were about 30 to 50 million per year uh, as far as the total open source hardware economy uh, at present so that has got way to go next steps 2026 libre medicine open source medicine well, that's a huge area of endeavor we'll ha handle that later i don't know what that really means means right now but it can mean the fact that first of all we open source equipment related to healthcare, but start with thing a more integrated approach which is healthy food and preventive medicine okay um, so as we have all the technologies developed, then we can build the villages of tomorrow. So, but to do that, we need to know how to get along. That's going to be the hardest part. That's going to be harder than technology. But the governance, sound, sound and innovative governance systems for how you steward resources in the future, kind of like indigenous people have been stewarding resources for a long time. How does it look like when we talk about regenerative development in the future? So governance, that's a 2026 milestone. And first OSC campus prototype by 2026. That means within a few years after all the technologies are done, we're able to build a fully integrated education slash production facility that, that includes its own energy production, food production through regenerative agriculture, and is just a beacon of light for all of civilization. So, so the first one by 2026 and from which place it can replicate. So publishing, spreading culture in 2027, publishing houses, that would be good at that time. Once we've got enough information to share, uh, creating culture by publishing or video. So 2028, OSC News or video station, uh, that capacity to sp spread culture has to be put in. Uh, by 2029, we can replicate the first campus. That would be a good milestone. Uh, basically, a few years after the first OSC full campus has been developed, we can, we can replicate and hopefully get that viral around the world viral campus replications by 2030 how well if it's working if the technology is there the business models for economic growth in the open source world are there uh, we can consider that viral campus replication is a feasibility okay by 2031 how about we eradicate artificial scarcity by that time that would be good if we have the means of open production that's accessible to anybody then then the startup of any enterprise should be rapid and that's the theory here that if things are open source you reduce the the barriers to entry to the point that anything related to material scarcity which if you think about it right now we live in a world of absolute abundance but at the same time absolute scarcity in a sense that distribution has not happened equitably there's a lot of artificial scarcity around and that things are kept kept scarce when they shouldn't really be and a lot of people are suffering but then but let's let's eradicate it by 2031. Uh, by 2032, the visionary goal would be to, to normalize regenerative development. That means the Earth is no longer getting destroyed and, and pillaged of its natural resources and biodiversity or human cultural diversity. By that time, uh, regenerative development is the norm. It's a viable alternative to just business as usual. And a practical self-determination option is created. Now, what's that mean? Self-determination is, is each person's ability to to create the full life that they want according to not not as not as in alienating their whole life to make a living because they have to, but pursuing their true dreams. Can we make that happen? So shifting on to 2033, agriculture shifts to perennial polyculture or regenerative uh, agriculture systems. Well, perennials are a sounder way to go about agriculture but that's a long-term development um, strategy uh, for example here we're working with badger set 
on breeding nuts that nuts nut trees that come true from seed that can provide like for example chestnuts and hazelnuts can provide 100 percent of of your diet as opposed to corn and soybeans kind of like as the staple of the of the american economy or the wor world economy can we transition more to perennials which don't have the the four ton per acre average soil losses that are currently associated with annual agriculture so 20 to 33 let's move to regenerative agriculture uh, by 2034, if, if we've got agriculture covered and the ability for people to self-determine, we can end all resource conflicts. How about that? And then we regenerate earth, the Earth's ecosystems and the open source economy transition is achieved as defined as the next trillion dollar economy that, that is viable and that much economic power happens in the open source, meaning that the culture has shifted to the fact that, okay, we're now collaborating as opposed to competing in general. So that's a brief overview of the roadmap. There's a lot of, of course, unknowns. We, we That's kind of the general course of events. So if anybody asks me, where am I? I'm going to tell them I'm, a, I'm on the road. And this is what OSE stands for and where it's going. And I actually encourage a lot of projects to, to create their own roadmaps because it helps us collaborate. Part of the collaborative literacy is we know where we're going. We can know where we're going. Maybe we can meet up in the future without without mapping that process. We, we don't know what's going to happen. So next is the, um, I'm going to talk about the 3D printer roadmap. So the 3D printer is now our main point of development as far as the distributive enterprise. So if you go to the uh, 3D printer roadmap, the second, the link um, in today's work. Okay, so uh, the main, I'll, I'll just let you look at that. That's, there's a lot of points on the, on the 3D printer roadmap. But what I'll mention briefly is the main status of that project. Because, as I said, it marks the first real attempt at the distributive enterprise. Please watch the intro video to that workshop if you haven't seen it and pass it along. Um, it's linked under 3D Printer Workshop. But the concept is getting that positive economic feedback loop. Uh, the concept is that the, the 3D printer is the most in developed open source technology hardware, hardware technology out there. And what if we can um, organize a very, very efficient workshop to, to create the best printer, the best workshop? Well, how do you do that? We talk about viral replicability criteria. I'm going to point you to, the, to that, and which include things like for, you have to start with open source product design, uh, if you want to develop open products, you're going to have to have a good online platform and community. You have to optimize the product. Use modular design, which allows you to work as large teams because you can break the thing into many parts. You have to have excellent open product documentation, translation into all languages, freely downloadable, downloadable designs, the existence of a distributed enterprise, a healthy developer community, transparent repository of designs, a scalable development process, training materials from design to build to using the tools in the design process, uh, open access to a developer toolkit, software and hardware tools platform, which which uh, allows you to work together efficiently. So we're talking along those lines with OSE Linux distribution so that everyone's on the same page when they use software. And immediately right now we're applying that with the 3D printer in a live USB uh, ISO, a live USB that you uh, basically a co whole computer system that you run off your USB so that any of the software issues around getting a successful 3D printer are annihilated because this USB works on any computer. You can plug it into your Mac, PC, or Linux and it works. Um, okay, and the last item of viral replicability criteria, which is just a set of general guidelines for what it means to make the best product and replicate that most widely. So the last item there is open source CAD design workbench and construction set to facilitate derivatives. So these are some of the, the main elements, but the concept is getting enough people, enough energy um, around a project to make it better than anything else. So right now we have hundreds uh, of different 3D printer companies. Um, there's of course different pr needs that are met, but, but for a lot of those companies, there's a lot of reinventing of the wheel. Um, so what if we can come up with a design that's flexible and that becomes a part of human appropriate technology. What does that mean? What would it look like for the 3D printer? Well, from our perspective of OSC, that means that we're creating a construction set 
as opposed to a plain machine. Because with a construction set, you have the enabling tools to design, to build, to modify. And therefore, if such a platform exists and there's community-based manufacturing using that platform, then in principle, that product can really scale and take over the marketplace. And that's kind of our theory, okay? Um, that can happen. Let's explore what that means. So the 3D printer, um, it, you won't hear it on the news, but actually the uh, talking to Joseph Prusa, who did the Prusa Mandel, the most replicated open source 3D printer, there's 80,000 of those in the world. Well, that's about as much as all the other proprietary builders, manufacturers combined. So what we've seen already is that the open source reprap project has essentially dominated the marketplace in 3D printing. Um, and we're saying, okay, let's do the same. Well, that was by different companies building on RepRap projects. So the, the two largest manufacturers today, which are MakerBot and um, Ultimaker, they're all derivatives of RepRap that went proprietary. Um, but we're saying, okay, so now we've got the technology that's still open, the, the base of the technology is still open. Now, what, it, what does it look like when we open up the enterprise model? So none of the companies, even the open source 3D printer companies, none of them really are what we call distributive, meaning they don't give their business model away to others or encourage others to replicate and therefore grow the, um, like they're the best printer in the world. Well, we're just trying to explore what it means if we can get more people around an open development platform, can that become a very powerful market force? And we talk about, we start to talk about market viral market substitution can the proprietary companies uh, be replaced by open source companies under the assumption that open is more distributive meaning more people gain access to economic power well if that theory that pop theory is correct um, things should become open source uh, if they are serving more people and we're exploring what that means can we make a delivered effort deliberate effort, which we are with a 3D printer, to make it a very distributive thing that can be used to fund projects, to generate livelihoods, along the lines of mass creation of right livelihood, which is what we ultimately stand for. Okay, that's enough on the um, 3D printer development, distributive enterprise, viral replicability criteria, 3D printer workshop. Uh, so the concept here is the extreme manufacturing workshop model I mentioned. Can we create a learning environment a group build process like we've been doing for the machine builds, for some of the house builds where you get a bunch of people around to build something. Um, can that model be a new model for how things are produced in communities? Well, um, if we can create, I, I think the answer is that people are very hungry for tangible production. And I think there's a, there's a large market for uh, giving people back those skills, that kind of meaning that's lost a lot in today's world. So with the extreme manufacturing workshop model, we're saying there's really not, um, you know, we don't really see a great world with the basically the factory, you know, factory farms and mega factories that deprive people of meaning because a different model can exist. Um, we, I think we will never reach appropriate technology. So this is this is another theory here. We cannot reach appropriate technology if people don't know what's under the hood. If it's always about consumer technologies that we don't know anything about, that's how we get a disintegrated world. Um, that's why you know things break break down after they reach a certain size. So we're saying. We have to reintroduce appropriate production, appropriate technology back to communities. And we're, the way we're saying that, we can relocalize manufacturing with flexible fabrication, open source production. And the social model there is, imagine that you have good enough documentation for a certain product. And we're experimenting with this on a 3D printer. We get great documentation, absolute transparency in the process and the whole workflow in the build. And what if, you create that environment that a single person can actually guide that event, the event MC, and people are able to teach each other because enough of a learning environment has been created towards a productive fusion. I would call it a fusion when there's enough diffusion 
of the learnings of the build that that we can organize an event where many people will actually do the build like the 3d printer and succeed at it with high quality control because quality control checklists and procedures are also included can this be a new model to contend with for how things are produced in the future so we're trying that with the 3d printer but can this apply to anything we think it can to cars to making engines to whatever it's an interesting feature that brings that production back to communities to to create a really different system than what we have today okay that's the extreme manufacturing workshop model it's part of open source product development you can look on the, click on that link and see what that's about there's some good seminal papers on what what product development is about and open source product development builds upon that especially with but the leading the seminal thinkers in the mainstream have already defined that a significant value proposition as well as the absolute modular architecture are keys so let's focus on the modular architecture they are keys to open product development to the success of effective new product development the ability to break something down to make it workable developable in parallel by many groups where then if you focus on how the interface looks between the parts and you can have many people in parallel working so that's the central theme of the open source product development we have to be aware of what else is going on so so what we will do is hold a first design sprint now which is part of the open our op version of open source product development that we're working on we're going to hold the first one this friday i'll announce that uh, on facebook pretty soon um, the design sprint will focus on getting the missing pieces of the 3d printer that we're working on right now the main things there's three things there right now which is the open source supply chain uh, 3d printer open source supply chain that means that you can be able to source the parts inexpensively from wherever you have to to make that happen and that that open source supply chain should be adapted to each each location like in america here in missouri we're going to have a certain supply chain someone in india might have a different supply chain we're working on that if you click on that link there's a document where we've broken the, the 3d printer down into all of its parts and we're looking for suppliers we got the majority of the kit from folger tech which is our supplier but the question is well what if they go under and we want to run these workshops what do we do then well we have to have a fully open source supply chain where we can uh, buy all the parts inexpensively to make to make the 3d printer happen supply chain issues are a huge issue they're they're a huge thing that's why we favor the concept of technological recursion we start making our own parts because all the time suppliers come and go you, that might not be reliable so that's the the design sprint will focus on taking that document and putting in more suppliers for each part there's a hundred about 160 unique part count the part count altogether is about 360 in the 3d printer build so the supply chain open sourcing is a big task that would lend itself to many people working on it so the next thing is the d3d live iso i mentioned that we're putting a, a set of software firmware settings and print files and other supporting software on a ready ready to boot live usb with a linux distribution on it so that we don't get into any computer issues during the 3d printer build last thing is uh, i want to talk about the 3d printer roadmap um, we want to develop 3d printers but not only those but products of 3d printers an interesting opportunity comes up with a 3d printed cordless drill because it's one of those things that we for example we go through a lot of that and it's also a six billion dollar market in the united states alone but an open source 3d printer drill 3d printed drill would allow the cordless drill which which basically lasts here they last between a few weeks and a year uh, even if we get the good ones because people break them but that would turn the open source drill meaning you print the case and then you have you use standard parts like the gears and battery and trigger but that allows that technology to turn from a throwaway device to a lifetime design item and it's very interesting because if we talk about mapping out how a certain open source product can can disseminate through the um or take take hold in the market if you have a value proposition of a lifetime design 
3D printed drill that's also upfront, less expensive and because the whole supply chain is open source and so forth. Um, can that start to dominate a given market? Well, uh, we're bringing up the um, cordless drill because there's zero open source cordless drills out there today. So if we took on the, the, the cordless drill, it would allow us to get a clear measurement of the diffusion of the number of open source cordless drills. It would make a real business case study of the potential of open source economic development. Now, we're doing a 3D printer, but that's really hard because already there's thousands or 100,000 open source printers out there. It's going to be very hard to count what, what is, uh, how many of those have been built in the future as a result of our work versus what already existed. Did we actually do anything for the 3D printer or, or maybe it was insignificant? Our claim is that if we make a 3D printer construction set that, that many people can gravitate to it and you will hold a, a decent market share, especially when our goal is a, a scalable, open source, multi-purpose, high quality industrial scale 3D printer. Um, and right now we're, we're doing what we can with a Prusa i3 that is not an industrial grade printer. Now, the two main things that are required are a stationary build platform and a closure to keep the environment very much controlled. Uh, so we're far from that, but we're we're trying to get there. So with that said, I think that that's that's a mouthful for now, and I'll quit at that until next week. But maybe I can um, ask for a few questions if anyone has any in the audience. We'll spend ten minutes on on questions, and then we can roll on further. So thank you for listening. Any questions for... Um, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, James Quaid of Phoenix. Hey, James. Um, yeah. What, in your 3D printer, do you, is the Arduino, uh, does it have any uh, shields or darter boards uh, attached to it to, yeah. uh, for your 3D printer? Yeah, so the current one that we're using has got the ramps board on it. It's called ramps. It's a, one of the standard boards, but the Arduino basically has a shield on it. And that's that's uh, completes the controller system for the 3D printer. So it's that's open source. That's you know all open source parts, not expensive. Um, the ramps no, is. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. I just I went over to the uh, controller box <coughs> wiki link and I was just looking for some details. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. your 3D printer has a lot of a great deal of uh, potential because the number of people are getting into it. My son's running. I don't know the mm -hmm. manufacturer. But he has a open source 3D printer. He's got a pretty expert at it. He does jewelry and custom jewelry and casting with it. So, uh, but yeah. actually, your model is much more open than the one he's uh, using at the moment. Yeah. And uh, very, very interesting. Uh, what is the, uh, how much for the, the parts to get into uh, uh, building your own uh, 3D printer? At the very minimal case, it's about 300. We're actually adding a couple of features to this, we're actually adding the self-leveling bed because in order to, yeah, to, just for everybody else, in order to, the, the standard 3D printers, you might have to adjust their levelness because the bed might get off, off level. And the auto leveling feature allows it to be pretty much a completely turnkey device where you just hit print and it prints. You don't have to make any adjustments or anything. I think the bed leveling is absolutely critical to making a consumer grade device that, that you can just use. For us too, I mean, I don't want to, every time I want to print something out, I don't want to be messing with the bed. It's one of those things where you just want it to work. But anyway, um, price, price point for a cheap kit today is around $300. And then of course, from that point, we're going to have to go up to replacing parts or making parts better as we go into the further iterations so we're part of the study in this whole game if we want a really really robust printer we have to do some research on the particular kit and parts that we get it's part of the open source supply chain how long is that going to work is it going to give us a year of good service well we know that we can always fix it but i mean how how long are the parts going to last in it and then we can make improvements to better parts or to change the entire system. I mean, our initial goal was to use this 3D printer only as long as until we get our first iteration of our own design. So that's that's the goal. So we'll run this workshop a few times, then continue developing.
you do you have the uh, FreeCAD uh, G code interface already done? Um, no. We as far as the FreeCAD, as far as designing the three D printer, like a like for no, the sorry, for driving for downloading the code into the three D printer. Yeah, that that already exists. We have that documented in the Prusa i3 build. We have we have that. Uh, that was one of the things actually um, it didn't work initially so we had to fix some of the things in there so but we did get that working so the full so software tool chain we have that and in fact as I mentioned we have the live USB stick that if somebody for example can't download the software if they have trouble or whatever they have a sure fire so solution you, you just run the 3d printer controller just Instead of booting into your computer, you're booting off, booting into a system that's on your, on a USB. So we've got that pretty well covered right now. Uh, we're using um, the software which is called Pronterface, and um, I'm also gonna try to talk to see if we can get. Uh, what I really like is the Lulzbot Minis, um, Lulzbot Cura Edition. Cura is the controller software. They have a really nice version. I'm going to see if we can maybe get that because it's super turnkey, very easy to use, very um, user friendly, graphics friendly. So uh, we'll try to make that a little bit of development. But these are the kinds of developments that can continue happening um, as we move forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don, do you have any questions? Um, That's a mouthful for possibly. what we... Possibly. Yeah. Talked about a, a, quite a bit of things. We're going to basically trying to get the, you know, get a lot of the updates on what's happening and how we're going about things to get the crowd development happening. So, yeah. The, the 3D printer workshop sounds very interesting um, but personally I'm more interested in some of the other workshops mm -hmm. yeah um, I, in my email um, the because the the email I sent you mentioned they attended one day of your uh, micro house workshop yeah. in 2014 yeah um, so I want to attend a whole week. Mm -hmm. um, and if this year you have another, uh, let me see. No, wrong tab. Yeah, we don't uh, have the schedule. Open source, and, yeah. open source mapping. If you have another one this year, um, I would be interested in that as well. Yeah, yeah, we just recently reestablished contact with the Open Drone Map and the Open Pilot projects, which are about generating open source land maps. That would work really well if we can then apply the autopilot, the, the Open Pilot software to our tractors, where we can do precision keyline agriculture back on our land. So our tractors can lend themselves very well to actually to becoming, to converting into into automated control so yeah we're going to definitely consider having a, a workshop on the open mapping and open site design it's something we still have to complete for our site where we are planting about 10,000 nut trees this year so we're going to be doing the full key line based planting and we need that, that kind of accuracy we won't have this ready for by the time of the plant out because that's going to be May 15, but yeah, we'll continue. Yeah. Uh, what is the, usually it seems like the workshops are more uh, geared towards build, except for, except for that. That particular workshop is yeah geared towards you know mapping and design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with that one, it's it is uh, mapping and design. If it were um, the other version of that, would be that we actually build the open source drone 
which actually relates to the 3D printing because you can print a lot of the drone parts with the 3D printer. So that would be an interesting application of kind of like migrating from the 3D printer to something where you can build your own open source drone where both the technology, the hardware, and the software is fully open source and can get you to very interesting applications. Yeah. Um, is there any sort of uh, like product life cycle workshops planned for the future? Um, it might be in the in your roadmap, and I just haven't seen it. No, we haven't really talked much about that yet. I mean, we, we do talk a lot about product life cycle. Do you mean as in like cradle to, to cradle that sense of life cycle? Or are you talking about lifetime design or? Uh, the idea is cradle to cradle uh, circular uh, economics. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talk about that a lot, like, for example, essentially, you know, if we talk about the induction furnace or the metal, um, the rolling of our metal, that's a really an ultimate cradle to cradle example where we build machines, then they break, we take the metal and recycle it to make new machines. That's a that's an ultimate example of that. And things like the biochar part that we're growing our plants those plants take up carbon dioxide from the air to grow and then we we can burn them as fuel as biochar for example so we have a totally circular economy on the fuel cycle using our local plants so there's a lot of different kinds of um, closed loop closed loops built in like for example uh, with a 3d printer you can melt down the things that you like plastics you can melt down various plastics including polycarbonate for polycarbonate glazing and you can reprint them. So there's another closed loop cycle there. There's a lot of lot of examples of, of product ecologies and closed loop cycles. So we haven't thought about a specific um, workshop on that, but in general, the things that we do build consider that in many ways. Yeah. It, it's sort of already integrated in many of the workshops. Yeah, it is. Already. Yeah. So it... it it might not be that beneficial to have a workshop all by itself because it's already yeah. a part of many of the workshops. Yeah, these days we're focusing on building things and things like houses or machines or other things, integrated systems. So yeah, it's we really like to focus on the, the hands-on, the, the, re, the recreating our realities in the open source way. Yeah. So, okay, so we're getting towards the end of the hour, so I'm going to need to wrap up here, but feel free to uh, send follow-up questions. We are posting this online, so you can look on the Facebook. Also, the link from this Facebook will has the, the Collaborative Literacy Webinars page where we'll keep, a tr keep track of all the webinars that we've had, so you can review them at a future date. So I'm going to record this, uh, finish up here, post that on YouTube, and um, I will also post the announcement for the Friday Design Sprint where we're going to list, basically lay out, okay, here's the, the main tasks which I mentioned briefly today that have to be done and how do we actually get a, a number of people working on that to create the open source supply chain and other items that we're interested in. So. So thank you for participating today. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead. One other is the design sprint. I, I don't quite understand. Is that specifically for the 3D printer? It will be. It will be specifically okay. on the remaining tasks to get that to where we want it to be by the workshop time. So that's where okay. I'm at. And, and future workshops throughout the year will also have to design sprints indeed uh, indeed i mean the, the workshop yeah uh, the design the workshop and so. yeah definitely the design sprints apply to the development of anything that we can think of from the machines to direct support of the workshops that are in the future any kind of task that that can be doled out to a number of people and we definitely plan on not just of course the 3d printer but all the other projects the brick press the housing 
hosting future design sprints on mills so okay i'm yeah. i'm very interested uh in the design sprints not not particular uh not necessarily for the 3d printer yeah but i i really hope the 3d printer design sprint and workshop goes very well for you yep that's it okay so i need to cut out and thanks for for listening today and we'll continue this with many more in the future take care then all right thank you bye